pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Mahmoud uh, Al-Khulani. So Dr. Mahmoud has a Master of Science from Ain Shams University. He has an FRCA followed by European Diploma or European Diploma of Intensive Care and followed by an FRCA. He graduated from Ain Shams University in 2005. Uh, he is in the United Kingdom uh, since 2013. He is currently a senior registrar of pain medicine and that's his area of interest. And he's an is he's a senior registrar in anesthesia as well. So he's working as pain and anesthesia senior edge in the national training program, Health Education England Northwest. And he is an honorary lecturer in the Manchester University. And as well in Ain Shams, he is a teaching assistant. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Mahmoud, go ahead and share. Right. Um, so again, thank you very much, Walid, for this presentation. Like I said, it's a long journey together uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm Mahmoud Al-Khulani, I'm talking to you from Manchester, uh, United Kingdom. Um, before starting, I'd like to say that I hope that all of you guys out there uh, are staying safe and sound uh, during the unprecedented circumstances of the COVID-19 crisis. And I hope that things will settle really soon uh, with all of yourself and your beloved ones uh, safe and sound and unharmed. Um, also, I'd like to say um, Ramadan Karim for all of uh, the audience observing the blessed month. Um, unfortunately, as usual, uh, it's flying really fast and we're heading towards the last 10 days of Ramadan. Um, so may Allah grant us all acceptance uh, in this blessed month and bestow his blessings upon the whole universe in these uh, circumstances. Um, I'd like as well to thank the organizing committee for uh, this splendid course, for the effort and time uh, they invested in order to execute it uh, in this uh, form that's coming to you in the comfort of your offices, hospitals, or uh, houses. Uh, I've been asked today to give uh, a basic science uh, lecture uh, related to pain medicine, uh, which is pain physiology. Uh, but before starting, I'd like to say that whenever I'm asked to give um, a basic science topic, I'm always wary uh, for a number of reasons, really. Um, so A, basic science is basic science. It's available in textbooks, and anyone can do some reading and develop some factual knowledge about it. Uh, I'm conscious as well that you might run the risk of um, candidates uh, getting bored and switching off after a couple of slides. And I'm conscious as well that not all, not all our audience are exam candidates. So some of them might be uh, experts in their field and they are seeking some sort of refresher uh, from our lectures. So bearing all of this in mind, I'd like to say that when, I'm, when I was preparing my lecture, I tried to focus only on the salient points uh, related to pain physiology. Uh, and having said all of that, uh, all of us with interest in pain medicine um, know well that uh, pain physiology is like the bread and butter of pain. Uh, whenever you have good understanding of, of this topic, uh, you'll have good understanding of how acute and chronic pain conditions uh, happen. So let's kick start after this um, uh, introduction. Uh, so conflicts of interest, I have none here uh, to declare. Uh, objectives of uh, my lecture today, like I said, uh, we're going to give a flavor uh, of the basic uh, physiology of uh, pain, uh, especially the pain pathway, how acute pain is transmitted, and how patients can move from uh, acute pain conditions to chronicity. And I'll try as well at the same time uh, to link this uh, to practice in order to make sense of the knowledge that we are discussing today. Um, I think before delving in our topic today, uh, I need to relay uh, some basic concepts. And the first one that I'm going to start with is definition of pain. Uh, what's pain? So the International Association for the Study of Pain defined pain as an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience, secondary to, to tissue damage or potential for tissue damage. And I think every single word in this definition is really important because as you can see, it's not only a biologic uh, problem, which we're gonna discuss in this lecture, uh, but also there are emotional uh, components for pain. Uh, um, and all of us working in pain, we receive patients in our clinics distressed with anxiety and depression disorders. Um, also, we said it's due to actual tissue damage or potential tissue damage, and that's important. So if we're talking about a post-operative acute pain condition, for example, um, there is tissue damage obvious in front of us, uh, but if we're dealing with a chronic pain condition, there might not be any correlating uh, tissue damage or any evidence in imaging suggestive of tissue damage. And this takes us actually to another point which is really important, which is the biopsychosocial background of pain disorders. 
So what I'm going to talk about today is the biologic background, how pain happens and how chronicity uh, might develop, but actually without addressing the psychologic and the social background of pain, it's very unlikely that your management plan will be successful. Uh, also, before leaving the slide, I'd like to classify pain. So as any other medical condition, according to duration of pain, it can be acute uh, of short duration, less than three months uh, of duration, or it can be a chronic condition when it extends beyond uh, three months and beyond the process of healing. Uh, also, in, in terms of the types of pain that we can come across, so pain can be nociceptive, secondary to a noxious uh, stimulus, uh, but at the same time, it can be uh, neuropathic uh, due to dysfunction uh, in the nervous system, peripheral or central. And to be honest with you, you all know that in your clinics, you rarely uh, receive a distinctive type of pain. Most of times, uh, you receive a mix of both nociceptive and neuropathic pain. And definitely pain can be also cancer pain secondary to a cancer uh, state which could be uh, nociceptive neuropathic or mix of both so let's delve more in our um, topic today and um, so how acute pain is transmitted um, and how this might move into a chronic pain condition so let's assume you're walking and you stepped in on a nail uh, and then you perceive pain what's happening in our bodies when this happens um, so in simple words, you will step on the nail, you will say, ouch, and then you will withdraw your foot, uh, and then you'll develop some sort of memory and experience in your brain, um, telling you that this is harmful, don't do it in the future, uh, and most probably the healing process will take over and restoration of homeostasis will happen and then the pain uh, will stop. In some patients, uh, for different reasons, uh, most of them are not totally understood, this might extend even further than this point and lead to a chronic pain condition. But what's happening specifically on biologic basis uh, in those patients? Quickly back to medical school uh, knowledge, we know that any neuronal reflex includes receptors in the periphery. Here, these will be the nociceptors, includes neurons and tracts as well, carrying the impulse from the periphery up to the higher centers, uh, which are capable of interpreting um, uh, the process uh, and leading to uh, a reaction to that. And over the coming slides, uh, we'll be discussing this in a, a little bit more detail. So like I said, uh, you have a tissue injury, like stepping on a nail or touching a flame or having an operation, for example, leading to tissue damage. Uh, this leads to release of number uh, of mediators and leads to activation of local cells as well, like neutrophils, macrophages, um, and uh, mast cells. Uh, those mediators, including serotonin, histamine, prostaglandin E2, uh, sodium, hydrogen ions, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they go and bind to specific receptors on the pain receptors, which are the nociceptors. So what are those nociceptors? These are uh, unmyelinated nerve terminals in the periphery uh, that are responsible about uh, perceiving pain. So they respond to mechanical, thermal, or chemical stimuli. Those mediators go and bind uh, on those specific receptors and trigger an action potential uh, in these receptors. Uh, when this happens, pain is transmitted afterwards um, along uh, the first order neurons by name, C fibers and A delta fibers. As we can see here, they travel along um, the nerves and their cell bodies actually are in the dorsal root ganglion and they travel all the way until they enter the spinal cord uh, through the dorsal horn of the spinal cord which is a massively important part uh, in the spinal cord, a massively important part in the pain pathway where loads of modulation happen and where a lot of justification for why we use this particular medication in pain medicine, as we're going to see in the coming few uh, um, slides, why this medication works, why this one doesn't. Most of this is justified by having good understanding uh, of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. We'll come to this slide later. Uh, so we talked about the first order neuron, they enter the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, they terminate into um, uh, the, the dorsal horn in what we call Rexid's laminae. Um, so C fibers, for instance, will end up uh, in lamina two and three, uh, while A delta fibers uh, will end in lamina one and five. And there is what we call substantia gelatinosa of Rolando, uh, which is lamina uh, two, uh, one, one and two, uh, which is really important, and this is where uh, the, the, the ascending uh, tract 
uh, the spinal thalamic tract uh, were arise. After the end in Riggs and Slamini, um, some synapses happen with the second order uh, neurons. And those synapses happen via interneurons in this area. So it's rich in uh, interneurons. And this depends actually on number of mediators. Um, one of them is glutamate, which is the main um, stimulatory uh, neurotransmitter uh, in the brain. And um, actually this works a number of important receptors. So A, they work on the AMBA uh, receptors, which are active uh, during acute pain conditions. And we have another class of receptors, which is really important. And please bear it in mind because we'll refer to it later during our lecture when talking about chronic pain, uh, which is the number receptors. Uh, they are dormant during acute pain uh, process and then become activated uh, when there is a stimulus knocking continuously uh, on the pain uh, pathway. And we have the G protein uh, coupled uh, receptors as well. In addition to glutamate, uh, th th there is also substance P, uh, which facilitates the transmission of pain and at the same time works on very important cells called the glial cells. They are non-neuronal cells, but they help myelination of the nervous system, and they have very important role uh, in a development of chronicity of pain. These transmitters facilitate transmission between first order neurons and second order uh, neurons. Uh, also, there is inhibition uh, that happens at this area, and we'll talk about it later when we uh, touch base on the descending inhibitory pathway. Then arises the second order uh, neurons, and actually they come in types. Um, so you have the first one, which is the nociceptive second order neuron, what we are after, which decussates across the spinal cord and then ascends as the anterolateral spinal thalamic tract that transmits pain and temperature. Uh, but also uh, we might have proprioceptive uh, fibers, and we have another type of fibers, which please again bear in mind when we talk about chronicity, which is the wide dynamic range uh, neurons that are not active uh, during acute pain transmission, but uh, they become activated uh, during um, chronic uh, pain states. Um, and we'll talk about this later. I'll go back one slide uh, to my um, uh, fibers here. So as we said, pain is transmitted along C and A delta fibers. So why do we have different types of fibers? What are those types? As you can see, they are A beta fibers, which are responsible about transmitting uh, proprioception and pressure. Then we have the A delta and C fibers, which are responsible about pain and temperature. So why do we classify them like that? Uh, that's depending on two factors. A, the diameter uh, of those fibers, and B, uh, the myelination of those fibers. So the bigger the diameter, the thicker the myelination, the faster the speed of transmission, and the fastest in them all is A beta fibers. And to be honest, this, that makes sense because it, it's responsible about proprioception uh, and pressure. So, and, and this has to do with uh, the balance of the body. So if you're changing posture, you need something to fire really quickly, otherwise you're gonna stumble and fall. Uh, A delta fibers are slower uh, in terms of transmission and they are responsible about the sharp uh, pain. And last but not least, the C fibers, they are thin and they are unmyelinated and they are responsible more about the dull uh, pain. And these are the classifications uh, of nerve fibers. Uh, back to the rest of our ascending pathway. So we talked about nociceptors, we talked about neurons, we talked about the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, which we said is a very, very important area in the pain uh, pathway. And then you have the ascending uh, spinal thalamic uh, tract. This figure is explain more the ascending tract. So in your tract, you have uh, both fast discriminative fibers and you have slow uh, affective fibers, both of which arise together to the brainstem. Um, fast fibers don't have any time to waste, so they project to the thalamus, and from the thalamus, the third order neuron uh, starts um, going to the somatosensory cortex, uh, while the, fast, the, the slow fibers actually, or the affective fibers, they have some time, so they send projections to the reticular formation in the brainstem and the thalamus, and from there, there are some projections to the limbic system, 
um, and uh, to the autonomic uh, nervous system uh, as well. And from there, and hypothalamus, and from there, third order neurons uh, arise to the single leg gyrus uh, in the brain. Why this distinction has happened? It's because of the function of each of them. So fast fibers are responsible about what we call conscious perception of pain. Like when you stop, uh, step on a nail, for example, you have to react quickly. And this happens through the fast uh, fibers. It helps you to get to have memory and it helps you to discriminate and localize uh, pain. While the slow fibers are responsible ab about another uh, component of pain, uh, what we call uh, the affective a component of pain. And that's really important going back to the biopsychosocial model that we talked about, because there is strong evidence uh, using functional magnetic resonance uh, imaging uh, that certain areas responsible about emotions and affect in the brain uh, becomes activated uh, during pain conditions, especially when we start going towards uh, the chronic uh, side of pain. And this is why it's always uh, important to address the biologic uh, by giving medications or intervention, but at the same time, uh, the psychosocial uh, background of pain. We talked about this, how uh, the pain signals are um, processed in the higher centers. And then comes another important thing. Uh, like we said, the dorsal horn of the spinal cord is a very important area. A lot of modulation uh, happens in this area. And part of this modulation depends on the natural descending inhibitory pathways. So we can actually liken, liken it to the earthing wire in electricity. It dampens the stimulation. It stops the transmission. And the most important of them all uh, is the periaqueductal gray that arises from the midbrain. It receives projections from the higher centers and sends projections to the nuclear stravi magnus uh, as well, uh, which descends down to the posterior horn of the spinal cord. And depending on mediators like serotonin and endogenous endorphins and encephalins, they inhibit uh, pain, pain transmission. And this actually answers a very important question. Why do we use antidepressants mm. off license in treating chronic pain conditions? It's because they work on the reuptake of serotonin and noradrenaline, and they help to ease the firing of nerves through acting via the descending inhibitory uh, pathway. Similar thing for opiates as well. And the other descending inhibitory pathway is the locus seriolus, which descends down and inhibits uh, pain transmission uh, at the dorsal horn of the spinal cord uh, via noradrenaline. Uh, and this is why medications like clonidine uh, could be used as adjuvants uh, in the management uh, of pain. So, so far, um, we covered the whole pathway, ascending pathway for transmission of acute pain. Like we said, we talked about nociceptors, neurons, tracts, higher centers. And we talked about the descending inhibitory pathways uh, as well. Now we come to a very important concept in uh, pain, uh, which is the gate theory, um, described by one of the godfathers uh, of the pain medicine science, Milzak and Wall in, the 19, uh, in 1965. Uh, from its name, it's gate theory. It's talking about a door that opens and closes in order to modulate uh, pain transmission. And actually, the end result uh, of this balance between facilitation and stimulation and inhibition is what governs what's going to happen, whether a healing process will ensue and the patient uh, will be free of pain or things will tip towards the stimulation and then the patient will end up having a chronic pain condition. So what happens during this gate theory? Like we said, you can close it and you can open it. You can do this presynaptically at the level of the first order neuron, or you can do this at the level of the second uh, order neuron. So for instance, like we can see here, if you stimulate C fibers uh, presynaptically, this leads to the release of substance B and leads to facilitation uh, of pain uh, transmission. Similar thing, uh, if we stimulate uh, the A delta fibers, post synaptically, uh, they go and inhibit the release of endogenous uh, endorphins and encephalins, uh, and this leads to facilitation uh, of the transmission uh, of pain. So that's about facilitation. What about inhibition? We talked already about the inhibitory pathways. So they work uh, on inhibiting pain transmission through mediators like noradrenaline, serotonin, and opiates. And this is why those medica like medications like um, tricyclic antidepressants uh, and opiates are effective uh, in pain. Also, the A beta fibers, which are responsible about pressure and proprioception, uh, if you stimulate these uh, postsynaptically, they inhibit uh, the C fibers 
uh, via GABA uh, receptors uh, and leads to inhibition of transmission of pain. And that actually justifies something uh, really funny when you bruise your arm or bruise your uh, leg, for example, and you rub it, um, the pain eases. And this is through the A uh, beta fibers effect on the gate uh, theory. Uh, also, the A delta fibers that we mentioned earlier in facilitation, they have rule and inhibition. So they have like feedback mechanism on the in, in, uh, descending inhibitory pathways. And when they stimulate, when it stimulates them, it helps them to exert uh, their effect on inhibition uh, of pain transmission. And we can apply this actually to practice uh, by looking at this diagram, which shows which medications work where on the pain pathway and justifies why we use a lot of medications, including adjuvants, including magnesium, including clonidine, including things like local anesthetics. So some people, for example, um, uh, use um, lignocaine infusion. It's, it's well researched in lower GI surgery. Um, uh, others might uh, use regional or local as part of a multimodal uh, approach to pain relief. Anticonvulsants as, as well, working on the peripheral sodium uh, channels uh, like gabapentin and uh, pregabalin. There is an important medication here, which is ketamine. We'll talk about in a second when we start talking about uh, chronicity, uh, which is very effective uh, in intractable acute pain conditions. Uh, some people use it as infusion, uh, for example, during complex uh, spine surgery perioperatively, and they can discharge patients to high dependency unit or ICU on this medication as part of a multimodal uh, approach. And they have a role in chronic pain as well because they are numda receptors antagonist. Um, and we'll see this uh, in a second. So now uh, we are done with the acute uh, pain transmission. When a stimulus or injury happens, how we develop acute pain. And now we come to a very interesting question. So how this might move from acute pain condition to chronicity and which patients uh, will be liable for this uh, to happen. Um, so as you can see from this diagram, I hope it's um, clear for you. Uh, when you have an ongoing stimulus, this leads to ongoing inflammation uh, in the periphery. And this ongoing inflammation doesn't go without an effect. So it have it has some consequences. So it leads to upregulation of receptors. It leads to decrease threshold for excitability. Uh, it, need, it, it leads to expression uh, of different sort of receptors. And all of this leads to a state of peripheral sensitization, hyperexcitability in the periphery, some sort of hyperalgesia uh, in the periphery due to the knock, knocking uh, effect of uh, the stimulus that hasn't been treated or put under control. Is it only in the periphery? No, the answer is not. Uh, it also extends uh, in the central part of the nervous system. So some sort of central sensitization happens. How this happens, remember what we mentioned, numda receptors. Those receptors are closed by magnesium plug. They are not active during acute pain conditions, but when you keep stimulating them all the time and develop some sort of slow depolarization, this magnesium unfortunately gets displaced. Calcium, influxes inside the cells, and this is followed by glutamate and glycine, which are excitatory neurotransmitters, and leads to a very important phenomenon in the chronicity of pain, which is the wind-up uh, phenomenon. Also, this leads to stimulation of the dormant wide dynamic range uh, fibers and leads to a state of neuroplasticity in the nervous system. Remember, when you're preparing for an exam and you're reading and revising and repeating all the time, the data or the information that you have in your uh, book uh, or notes is transformed into facts uh, in your brain. And this is due to the neuroplasticity. You're teaching your brain, you're training your brain, you're repeating it again and again. In the context of studying, that's really um, useful because you're gonna pass the exam, but in the context of chronic pain, it's nuisance, it's not useful. It's not like the man that stepped on the nail and withdrew his foot in order not to uh, develop more damage. It's an absolute nuisance. This is what the patients come to you complaining of. Our life is turned upside down. We need a solution. And unfortunately, not a lot of people would understand this because there might not be obvious damage uh, in the, um, in the system, in, in the whole system of the patient to justify th this pain, but it's secondary to things like the wind-off phenomenon and the neuroplasticity that has happened already in the nervous system. 
Uh, also in this uh, process, the glial cells that we mentioned earlier, they get stimulated and those glial cells release uh, some mediators and they contribute uh, to the process of central uh, sensitization as well. Um, this is a picture showing the non-receptors. Like we said, they are closed by magnesium plug. They are dormant during acute pain transmission, but when the stimulus keeps knocking on again and again and again, this magnesium plug uh, gets displaced, leading to calcium influx, followed by glutamate and glycine, leads to conformational changes in the non-receptors and leads to the wind up uh, phenomenon. And this is why using things like ketamine, methadone, magnesium, and other uh, non-receptor antagonists uh, have rule in minimizing the risk of uh, developing chronic pain, but you have to be cautious uh, because something like ketamine does have loads of side effects. So if you're going to start it, it has to be last resort, short period, and closely monitored uh, by the clinician in order for things not to go wrong. So like we asked earlier, why some patients uh, will end up developing chronic pain and why others uh, won't, and they end up you know, recovering from their acute pain state. And there are risk factors for that. Some of them are related to the patients uh, and some of them are related to the medical background. But I'd like to take you back here quickly to the biopsychosocial uh, background that we talked about. And I'll use near placement therapy as a near placement operation as an example. So a lot of times you receive in the clinic a patient with a newly uh, replaced knee, perfectly done from a radiologic uh, point of view, but they are still in pain. And even they might say that we are in terrible pain compared to pre-op, and we hope that we haven't had this operation done first place. And then when you delve in their history and start talking with them, you'll find them on big doses of opiates beforehand, that haven't been uh, cut down uh, by the clinician looking after them, haven't been flagged to the team uh, either in order to know that this patient is at high risk of having pain postoperatively. Those patients might be distressed as well because they were not able to mobilize around and they are load on loads of medications uh, for their pain. So this hasn't been uh, addressed either. Uh, and the patient ends up in, in a mess afterwards because they are still in pain and their expectations were not uh, met appropriately. Similar thing for the failed back surgery syndrome. Uh, when I, and, and, and luckily, neurosurgeons are wise now and they don't do surgery uh, for the sake of pain. They do it for neurologic deficit. Uh, but when it comes to pain, they counsel their patients really well and they tell them that you might have the operation, but things might get worse. And it does. And they end up having failed back surgery syndrome uh, coming back uh, to us. Uh, and at this point, um, comes the, the biopsychosocial uh, model, the psychosocial in particular, because sometimes there is little to offer those patients uh, in terms of medications and interventions. But what you need to do is to help them to develop coping strategies, to steer their mind away from pain and to help them to regain quality of life uh, and coping strategies uh, with, uh, with pain. Um, some operations are at higher risk uh, compared to others. It, 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 in addition to the things that we mentioned, like being on uh, a huge amount of medications, being on large doses of opiates, expectations not met. Uh, for example, we send our knee replacement patients to surgery school beforehand, uh, where they get educated about their expectations postoperatively. If they are on large doses of opiates, we'll start cutting down on these gradually uh, in order to prepare them uh, for surgery. Like I said, some operations are more uh, prone than others. So amputation. Uh, mastectomy, and it's it's totally intuitive. A lady with cancer breast is going to lose um, her breast, and uh, she's stressed and um, anxious about the cancer stage. She might be on uh, antidepressants uh, as well, uh, and it's not surprising that despite the operation went really well, and she might have had multimodal uh, nice approach for her pain relief, but she goes on and develops a chronic pain uh, condition. Uh, also thoracotomy, uh, repeated inguinal uh, surgery repair, uh, and so forth. So what's my role uh, as a pain uh, clinician with these patients in order to prevent the, develop the development of chronic pain? So it's essentially being proactive, figuring out those patients and picking them up um, during the pre-op assessment and flagging them uh, to the pain team and working out a plan for those patients, tailing their expectations 
in order to have a successful um, outcome. Uh, and part of it actually is aggressive treatment of acute pain. Uh, that's really important using multimodal approach. Uh, so for example, if you're doing a laparotomy and you need your patient to recover quickly, I don't think you're gonna do it without putting a thoracic epidural if there is no contraindication or at least rectal sheath catheter, which are coming into practice more and more. And I think that's standalone topic that we might be able to talk about in the future, analgesia for uh, laparotomy. Uh, if you think that your patient is at high risk of developing chronic pain, uh, why don't you think about adjuvants, like we said, ketamine, lignocaine infusion, gabapentinoids, but I would be a little bit um, skeptical about gabapentinoids. A lot of people use them in the context of uh, operations, especially joint replacement surgery, but actually the number need to treat is relatively high. Um, so the evidence actually behind their effect is not very robust, but I would say they might have some opiate sparing uh, effect, but you have to be careful when you're prescribing them to elderly patients and patients with, with renal uh, problems because they accumulate and they have sedative effect and actually combination of gabapentinoid along with opiates is a recipe for disaster because elderly patients might arrest, have respiratory arrest in hospital, unnoticed because of this dangerous combination. So if you do it, do it carefully, please. And like we said earlier, you have to address the psychosocial background of your patients. In some practicing cultures, uh, like the North American culture, for example, they are privileged, they have more money, and they might be able to have an inpatient psychologist who can deal with those patients. Here in UK, unfortunately, we, we have outpatient psychology service. We have the pain management program for chronic pain patients, but we don't have this privilege of having inpatient psychologists in uh, all hospitals. Some of them, they do have inpatient psychologists, but that's a very, very uh, rare uh, occurrence. So what's the take home message? This, this is almost my last slide. So what's the take home message uh, from our lecture today? So we touched base uh, on the basic physiology uh, of pain transmission in order to have understanding of acute pain and how this acute pain can be transformed into a chronic uh, condition. Um, this actually opens the door, as you can see from all the slides we went through to uh, researchers and enthusiasts uh, to try to invent uh, new medications. Unfortunately, over at least the past two decades, no new medications have emerged in uh, pain uh, medicine. So this opens the door, this understanding opens the door uh, for the potential for any new medications. And the point that I'd like to stress on, have a plan, an analgesic plan for your patients all the time and focus on the biopsychosocial background uh, of your patients uh, if you'd like to have a successful uh, management plan. This concludes my uh, lecture for today. Thank you very much indeed uh, for listening. If you can feel pain, you're alive. If you can feel the pain of others, uh, you're uh, human. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, these are my contact details. I'm happy uh, if you'd like to contact me for uh, any reason and I'm happy to receive any questions, please. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, and um... Allow me just to finish your presentation from here. Can you, okay, can you kindly stop your presentation? So, one second. Okay, perfect. So now we are all uh, live. Uh, thanks very much, uh, all uh, the speakers today, uh, Professor Dr. Ahmed Mukhtar, uh, and you have the mic. Uh, I will start with uh, Professor Dr. Ahmed Mukhtar uh, questions. Uh, so we can, we didn't have any questions yet for Dr. Mahmoud, just one just arrived now. Okay, perfect. So the first question for Professor Dr. Ahmed Mukhtar, I know you answered that in private but for the benefit of the public and uh, YouTube watchers, we need to escalate it on live. So the question is, can you make a stress on the inhaled antimicrobials and its uses? And they have the mic. Uh, <clears throat> um, the inhaled antibiotics should be used with intravenous route. If you have, a, for example, a multidrug resistant like Pseudomonas, uh, if you are treating pneumonia with the Pseudomonas, it doesn't, uh, it's not accepted to just treat the Pseudomonas with inhaled antibiotics. Uh, especially in this uh, in the context of the nosocomial infection or host acquired infection, because the pneumonia is a systemic disease. Uh, so this patient should, is, has a bloodstream infection, like a um, yeah, um, uh, lung infection, and the recommendation is, is to start 
intravenous antibiotics and in complicated cases or in difficult cases or in multi drug resistant, you add on inhaled antibiotics. This is number one. Number two, you shouldn't add inhaled antibiotics without um, sensitivity because there is a common practice that you give inhaled antibiotics and this antibiotic is resistant. This, this is totally wrong. The antibiotic should be sensitive. Uh, not only uh, just because I give uh, this antibiotic mm -hmm. in, inhaled and uh, inhaled route, it will be effective. It will not be effective if it's resistant. So the the conclusion is, if you have a multi drug resistance, like acinetobacter or um, pseudomonas or Klebsiella, any types of multi drug resistance, and if you the anti intravenous route failed, you add on inhaled uh, route. So you hit the bacteria with intravenous and inhaled antibiotics. Perfect. So I think the answer is more than clear. Thanks very much. So uh, next question is, what is the role of antimicrobials uh, in the COVID-19, if there is any role for it? COVID-19, actually, uh, the, the, for uh, um, uh, um, the azithromycin or the macrolide azithromyx, uh, based on the French study, that uh, combination between, which is not very good study, by the way, but if you have a combination, the, the, the study uh, found that if you have a combination between the hydroxychloroquine and the azithromycin, this may inhibit or decrease the viral duplication. Uh, so there's many protocols for initiation of the uh, treatment for COVID-19 containing both hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Here, the azithromycin is used not as an antibiotics. It's used as an antiviral, actually. So, so, but uh, if you if you want to ask about when to add antibiotics in patients with COVID-19, actually, if you have a sign of sepsis, if you uh, review the literature about this patient, the sepsis in this patient, uh, it comes late, about 15 days from the onset of the symptom, if it will happen. Uh, the, the, you have, when, when to suspect sepsis in this patient, if you have a leukocytosis, if you have a procalcitonin uh, increasing, uh, if you have deterioration of the general condition of the patient, not uh, just not explained by uh, only viral pneumonia, all this, same or have septic shock, for example, all this is an indication for adding antibiotics or antiviral. So we'll treat as a secondary bacterial infection on top of the COVID-19 rather than yes. for treating the virus itself. This is in a nutshell. Thanks so yes. much. Uh, the third question uh, from uh, Mohammed Magdi Gaber. Uh, I don't know what is fortum in, 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 uh, in a scientific term or the, the generic <laughs> name. Uh, so why we're using fortum with amikacin uh, and they have the same spectrum uh, in some ICU patients. Is right to use amikacin alone in post-operative neurosurgical patient while it has poor uh, CNS penetrations, it's actually a couple of questions, and you have the mic. Uh, the, the theory behind that, if you have a combination between two classes of the antibiotics, you have synergistic effect. But it is very important to have a different classes. You shouldn't combine the same classes. For example, you shouldn't combine two beta-lactam antibiotics. For example, we don't combine Fortum with Tynam. This is not uh, a, a normal combination or not uh, a right combination because uh, Fortum is a beta lactam antibiotic or Ciftazidine is a beta lactam antibiotic, it's a cephalosporin, and the imepenem is a cephalosporin. So you cannot combine, uh, imepenem, sorry, is a capapenem, is a beta lactam antibiotics. So don't combine the two classes of the antibiotic at the same, at the same time, but you can combine different classes. Amikacin is an amino glycoside, Fortum is a Ciftazidine with third generation cephalosporin. Combination between third generation cephalosporin and amino is is okay because it has a synergistic effect. So this is okay. But provided that we have a sensitive pathogens for both bacteria, for both uh, antibiotics. This for the uh, first part of the question. The second part, why we use the amikacin post op I don't know why. We are, because the amikacin is a very poor penetration in the CNS. And if you have a CNS infection, uh, with the, uh, with pathogens sensitive only to the amikacin, you have to inject this drug by intrathecal route. You cannot depend on the intravenous for cleaning the infection from the CNS by amikacin. Uh, thanks, Professor Dr. Ahmed Mukhtar. It was like really, you made it really easy for us uh, to understand the antimicrobials. So thanks very much for attendance here today. It's our pleasure.
really to have mm -hmm. this uh, topic that, that's mm -hmm. really like a basic topic and every anesthetist and intensivist thinks about it, particularly in his beginning of the career. Uh, now we'll go ahead uh, towards Dr. Mahmoud Al-Khulani. Uh, Mahmoud, your mic is unmuted here, so you're okay to go ahead. Uh, I, I, I cannot, يعني, I cannot uh, appreciate Excuse enough me, Dr. Walid. efforts. Excuse me, Dr. Walid. Uh, we still have a question for Dr. Yes, I, uh, I know. Dr. Okay, okay, we'll go ahead. Uh, okay, just one second. Uh, sorry, sorry, Walid. Um, uh, let me thank Dr. Finished thank thank you message uh, for Mahmoud Khulani. Um, uh, one of the most difficult topics is the pain physiology. I believe you really need to have the expertise, the interest, and uh, the full understanding of the science to make it uh, very simple as uh, such. So I'm really thankful to you again. Uh, we have a couple of questions to Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, one of them, I, I didn't I really what understand. Said, what, what he said, there is a, a question for Prof. Uh, Mukhtar as well. So if, if you do this first, and then I can answer oh, the questions. Okay. Yes. So yes, it's just, yes. it, okay. So uh, the question from uh, Inas Hosni, uh, what's your yes. opinion about intravenous antimicrobials at a childbirth? to prevent spread of group B strep and its uh, claimed association with autism. Is there any association between uh, the intravenous antimicrobials and autism? I don't know, I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm not sure that is uh, any relationship, but I, I don't know. Okay, thanks very much. So the first question is Mahmoud, uh, Pethidine, uh, what do you think about it in the acute pain and uh, its relationship with pain physiology, acute pain physiology? Uh, I, I think it's a bit like a generalized question or homogenous question, but, but if you have an answer. There is an answer. Uh, so here in UK, for instance, sometimes, but in very, very rare units, they might use it in uh, obstetrics um, for analgesia, uh, but mainly they depend on diamorphine, uh, but some units might use pethidine. But I would say, I'm, I'm replying here in two minds. I know how is Egypt. I've been away from Egypt for a good number of years now, but I know how is it difficult to have access to good analgesia perioperatively. So if you have nothing in your hands, so there is no point in asking, to be honest, because this is the only option that you have in your hands, so you have to use it. You, you won't leave your patient in pain. But if you have access to any other painkillers, I would definitely avoid pethidin, because I'm sorry to say that, but it's a dirty painkiller. It does have loads of side effects. Uh, it does have loads of interactions. And if you have access to other cleaner um, painkillers preoperatively in the context of acute pain, then stick to them. We are privileged here in UK that we have access to different classes of uh, painkillers. Like I said, pethidin is used on, on very limited uh, bases on, on the context of obstetrics in very rare units, not in all units. Uh, but if this is what you have, so you'll have to use it. Uh, and I think this is one of the things that we need to increase the culture uh, on in Egypt uh, carefully because other countries ended up in crisis, like United States, for example, ended up in opiate crisis. I'm aware about the misuse of things like tramadol in Egypt as well. So we have to increase the culture and educate carefully in order to have good outcome for our patients perioperatively, but at the same time prevent any other collateral damage from happening. Uh, if we open the door for uh, the use of opiates. Okay, I think that's more than enough. Uh, okay, and what's your experience, Mahmoud? A question from Ayman Abdelkarim uh, about using pregabalin as a preemptive analgesia. Uh, I would say there is no strong evidence. Uh, I would say, uh, I know again the culture of practice in Egypt, pregabalin is more expensive than gabapentin. Uh, and the other thing, uh, the dosing actually is less frequent. Uh, so people, patients will be happier to use pregabalin compared to gabapentin. Uh, the company that's producing pregabalin campaigned a lot and made a lot of effort in order to make it the only uh, class of gabapentinoids used in neuropathic pain. But the evidence is the number needed to treat with gabapentinoid, with gabapentin and pregabalin is not massively different. There is no difference between them. Both of them needs adjustment of dose and renal impairment. Both of them ha have the same side effect, apart from the fact that pregabalin, uh, the dose is less uh, frequent. So if you can, here in UK, I will start with the cheaper. Uh, so I'll start with gabapentin rather than uh, pregabalin. 
Uh, it's off license, so you have to let your patient know that's off license. You have to let your patient to know about uh, the side effects of this medication, especially in the Montgomery uh, era of practice, where you have to counsel your patients about any potential side effects of any intervention or any medication. Otherwise, you can be questioned uh, in a court flow if things go wrong. Um, there is no strong evidence for using it in acute uh, pain. Some people use it. I find it a lot in different protocols, especially in uh, knee replacement, uh, sorry, uh, joint replacement uh, surgery. Uh, like we said in the, in, in the lecture, use it carefully. Uh, know the side effects, explain them to your patients. The number needed to treat actually is high, so the evidence is not robust, but they might have some opiate sparing effect. So I won't say don't use it. Use it, but if it doesn't work, please stop it. Perfect. Uh, we're going back to uh, Professor Dr. Uh, uh, Ahmed uh, Mubarak. So I'm unmuting you again. Sorry for that. Uh, so again, uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed, the question, if a patient has a prolonged ICU stay, will you keep the same antimicrobials or just switch to another antimicrobial? He's talking about, uh, she's talking Asma al-Sharawi. She's talking about antimicrobials failure in ICU uh, due to prolonged ICU stay a couple of weeks or more. Uh, how you judge that or how you switch from an antimicrobial antimicrobial to another one? Uh, yani, uh, let, me, let us say that, there is, uh, that we should not use antibiotics unless the patient has an infection. This is cause very uh, common malpractice in uh, different ICU that the, if the patient in the ICU, he should receive antibiotics. This is totally wrong. So if the patient has an infection, we should treat the infection. But if the patient is has no infection, you should stop the antibiotics. This is very important. Uh, how to switch? If your patient have infection and you need to change the antibiotics, it is a different story. Usually you, you start the, uh, the certain class of the antibiotics based on the suspicious of the, what, uh, what is the, the infection. For example, if you have a pneumonia, if you have a line infection, if you have a sepsis in the abdomen, in the heart, Whenever you have a, a, a type of uh, uh, any infection, you have to start by specific regimen of the antibiotics. When this fail, you have two scenarios. Either you, the source is not controlled. For example, the, you should receive, you remove your line, central line, or change the central line. Or you have to upscalate uh, for more uh, antibiotics covering more multi-drug resistance. For example, if you start by, for example, ertapenem, ertapenem doesn't cover the pseudomonas, and this patient will not is not responding. So you suspect are suspecting that this patient have more gram-negative infection that you have to escalate from the ertapenem to carpapenem or meropenem. That's we have to escalate the antibiotics based on two things: on the source of the infection, on and the and the first thing, uh, and and the second thing on the type of the regimen that I started. Then if I covering the gram negative and I, I didn't start to cover the MRSA, you have to think about, you have to cover the MRSA. We are kind of covering the gram negative, the MRSA, you need to think about the fungi infection. That's, we are, um, but again, don't start, don't, don't put the patient on the antibiotics if the patient has no infection. You have to stop it. Okay, so uh, I, I would reinterpret that in my understanding to start empirical antimicrobials depending on the source, send cultures, depending on the cultures, either to narrow the spectrum or to escalate the antimicrobials depending on what you find in the cultures. And again, uh, check if the source is uh, lines uh, related sepsis, get rid of the lines and treat the underlying cause if there's anything treat, treatable like cellulitis or gangrene or anything like that. Is that correct enough, yes. uh, Dr. Ahmed? Yes. yes. So yes. the second question is asking about lactic acidosis with uh, associated with linezolid. Uh, did you experience it and how to monitor uh, and what are the precautions if I have a patient with septic shock with an already high lactate and I started linezolid? how quick linozolid can precipitate higher lactic acidosis and should I stop it or start another uh, antimicrobial regimen in the term of lactic acidosis from linozolid itself? 
Linozolib reduces lactic acidosis by mechanism uh, very uh, strange. It is um, it, in, it inhibit the um, uh, the um, uh, the some bacteria inside the gut. But the the how quickly the lactic acidosis it come from the linozolib? I think it, it it's um, uh, yeah yeah yeah. I mean, there is no exact timing for lactic acidosis from the lining. But I saw only one cases that happened after one week. But the lactic acid dose from the lining unit is totally different from the lactic acid dose by septic shock. Because the patient with the septic shock have other sign of the hypoperfusion, like increased capillary fill time, uh, organ dysfunction, that's it. But the in patient with lactic acid dose, the lining unit, the patient is perfect. And, and, but he has high lactate level. It's not explained by any other things. So, this, um, of course, if you have a patient with a septic shock and have a high lactate, but you can start linozolid, and when, uh, I don't expect that the linozolid will induce lactic acidosis immediately. This is not will do that like that. So, it's very difficult to have patient with a septic shock with high lactate, and you start linozolid, linozolid induce lactic acidosis at the same time. This not happen. Okay. So, if you have patient with patient in the ICU and start and on dinosaurs and they have a lactic acidosis, you have to differentiate. This patient is lactic acidosis due to hypoperfusion, organ dysfunction, uh, hemodynamic instability, that's it. Or this patient is totally okay, but has a just isolated lactic acidosis. This is very important to differentiate between the conditions. Perfect, that's perfect. Uh, we have three more minutes uh, to end our session, uh, yet we got a lot of questions here again uh, for Dr. Mahmoud. So the first question, quickly, Mahmoud, uh, maybe 30 seconds, we need to take all the questions. Uh, uh, what makes some analgesia effective in some patients but don't with others? It's a hard question to answer in 30 seconds. Uh, some patients feel pain uh, relieved with pethidine but not with morphine and vice versa. So why some uh, uh, analgesia or painkillers work with patients and don't work with others? One, one second, Mahmoud, you are yeah, muted. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm okay, muted. go ahead. So it's multifactorial. Uh, there are different reasons for that, specifically with uh, opiate painkillers. There's a line interruption. I don't know from my side or from yours. I can hear you, Will. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, it's, it's better now. It's better now. I don't oh. know. Okay, go ahead. So, like I said, it's multifactorial. In opiates in particular, there is a very well known phenomenon called opioid induced hyperalgesia, which is very, very funny. It's misinterpreted sometimes as if it's addiction or pseudo addiction or tolerance, but it's actually the fact that you will increase the dose and the pain will worsen because of this opioid induced hyperalgesia. And the way forward to treat this is to switch up between opiates um, or even stop opiates uh, for some time, which sounds counterintuitive. So this is well described with opiates. By, but, but why some medications in pain medicine work with some patients and they don't work with others for many reasons. A, our medications, most of them are off license. They are not designed as analgesics, but we use them off license like tricyclic antidepressants, uh, like anticonvulsants. And actually, the arbitrary um, benefit from these medications in context of chronic pain in particular is about 30 to 40 percent. So you don't have to make the expectations of your patient unrealistic. You have to let them know that your medications work in about 30 to 40 percent of cases, not to stop the pain altogether, but just to take the edge of pain and make it tolerable and make them able to function and get back to function. I think... Part of my answer to this question is something that I've been told from one of my consultants who trained me. Once we were talking about patient and I was talking about which medication we're going to use. And his answer to me was, have you ever seen me keen to treat pain? I'm always keen to make the patient regain function, but not treating pain itself. Sometimes it's very difficult, up to impossible, especially in the context of chronic pain. In acute pain, yeah, it's doable. You can use a strong painkillers, multimodal approach, but in chronic pain, your focus is more on regaining function and quality of life rather than treating pain because the damage that has happened has already happened in the, in the nervous system and it's very difficult to switch it off or reverse it back. 
Perfect. A uh, couple of questions from Muhammad Imam and Heba Salim and Post are asking about post-operative pain management. The first is about magnesium infusion, and the second one is uh, nalofen for post-operative pain after intraoperative morphine infusion. So one is asking about magnesium, and second one is nalofen. Uh, magne magnesium is helpful uh, in terms of uh, minimizing the risk of um, uh, chronic pain. Uh, we run it only during theta time, uh, five grams of magnesium, uh, and then uh, we stop. Uh, afterwards, uh, and it, it works well, but bear in mind that it might prolong uh, your muscle relaxant uh, effect. Uh, so be careful uh, while you're topping up your muscle relaxant intraoperatively, otherwise you'll have to sit with the patient for a long time postoperatively. In terms of um, nalofen, I don't have any experience in using it, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. It's not available here in UK, and I used it once in Egypt, and I wasn't really aware about um, you know how, how it works and what to expect and that was only only one time, so I, I'm not the best person to talk about. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have all the answers to all the questions all the time. So uh, back to uh, Professor Ahmad Mukhtar. Uh, the question is actually an interesting question. I, 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 it came to my mind a lot of times. He's asking about uh, the solving the antimicrobials in the semen substance using that for orthopedic surgeries. What's your input in that regards? Uh, I think uh, there is a different uh, studies um, examine this um, uh, to administer vancomycin, for example, in the size and size different region, and there is different uh, several meta analyses uh, published in this area. Uh, I think there is uh, the evidence in there that is. Uh, yeah, the ad locally administration of the vancomycin inside the wound increased the concentration of the level of the vancomycin high, very high inside the wound. Uh, a surgical insult, a surgical side infection. Without increasing the blood, which is very important, it didn't in the increase the level of the blood inside the, uh, with the vancomycin. And this, is the more safe, this is a safe practice. Vancomycin, as we told in the lecture, it is a nephrotoxic drug. So it is a common practice with some evidence, several published meta-analysis that is, did decrease the surgical site infection in orthopedic surgery. Uh, perfect. So allow me to uh, say a big thank you for your huge efforts done today, answering the question, uh, presenting these topics that's essential in our uh, daily practice, either from pain perspectives or from antimicrobials using critical care or anesthetics. Uh, and uh, by the end of this uh, uh, lecture, or this session, I would like to say thank you, Mahmoud Khulani. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Ahmad Mukhtar. Thanks, Prof. Okay. Dr. Uh, Saad Mahdi. Uh, thanks, Dr. Thank Walid Aswa. Uh, thanks, Amelion, uh, Dr. Hisham. So thanks for everybody working either uh, behind the curtains or uh, in front of the camera. Uh, there's a lot of efforts done behind that. So I'm really thankful to everyone here in this, uh, in today or in the past days and uh, Let's uh, meet you again in uh, next Thursday uh, with uh, two uh, more of our eminent speakers. And please follow up uh, on the Egyptian Fellowship Facebook group to find who are the next speakers, what is the next topic, and if there is any uh, change in, in time, we'll keep you updated as well uh, on the group. Thanks very much, and bye-bye for everyone. Well, thank you, Walid, for your effort as well. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for all. Thank you. Thank you.